Our next speaker is Dr. John Fellers. He is a USDA ARS research molecular biologist and adjunct professor in the Department of Plant Pathology at Kansas State University. He earned BS and MS degrees in agronomy from Oklahoma State University and a PhD in crop science from the University of Kentucky. John is specialized in host pathogen interactions between wheat and pathogens ranging from triticum mosaic virus to Puccinia triticina. His recent genomics work on Puccinia triticina has established the evolutionary trajectory of the global wheat leaf rust fungus population. And John, I hope you don't mind me saying that I know that in your spare time, you enjoy growing wheat on your family's farm in Oklahoma as well. So you're a very unique scientist who is also uh, a wheat grower. And with that, John, if you'd be willing to, to take it away, and you're welcome to share your video if you would like as well. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I'm trying to start my video. It looks keeps telling me that uh, you can't start it. Uh, the oh. host has stopped it. So that's all right. Let me go ahead and start sharing. All right. Is that working? Yes. OK, great. Well, I thank you, Matt, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for your time today. Uh, I, this is uh, a really a really big honor for me to be able to do this. Les has been a great friend to me and a mentor. And uh, at a time in my career when I was making a major change, uh, Les came in and uh, not only Les, but others at the, at the CDL helped me uh, transition from running a DNA sequencing lab for wheat into actually starting to understand a major wheat pathogen. And so uh, in 2000, I, I came to USDA in 1999. We established a wheat genetics, uh, 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 wheat DNA sequencing lab where we uh, clone, working on cloning resistance genes where uh, we did LR21 with Bikram Gill. And then, uh, so, uh, and then in 2005, in 2006, USDA funded uh, the regional wheat molecular marker labs, and at that time we decided to move the sequencer that I had my lab down to Guihua Bays, who used it for molecular markers. And so at that time, um, Bob Bowden suggested that I work on leaf rust. Uh, and so that started my um, walk down this path. And so uh, Les, was has had a major influence and so lesson and, and jim colmer were actually one of my first customers for our dna sequencing facility and they had uh, uh i or created a library using uh repeat capture columns and cloned up a lot of these uh, ssr candidates and we sequenced them assembled them and ended up with about 21 SSRs, which have been used quite a bit by uh, Jim and his work, and really has helped us uh, understand really a, what, a lot of what we know today about uh, leaf rust uh, genetic structure, population structure, not only here in the US, but worldwide. And so this was a very uh, key paper and key data and uh, it was fun putting that together and seeing uh, not only that sequencing facility that was funded by the Kansas Wheat Commission work on wheat, but also one of the major pathogens that affects Kansas wheat. Well, uh, during that time, I had a postdoc by the name of Dr. Craig Webb, and uh, we were trying to figure out a way how we could tag effector genes. Uh, we didn't have a genome sequence at that time, uh, and so I had done some work in my postdoc, uh, working on using DS tags to try to tag uh, disease resistance genes in tobacco. So the idea was, was to use the gene gun and use a just a common plasmid expressing GUS to try to insert it into the genome of the rust to try to knock out an effector to do selection 
pull those uh, tag genes out to see if it would work. And so Les uh, was actually working with uh, Goose Bachran at the time and uh, Richard Staples and uh, was able to set us up with uh, the plasmids. We got the techniques for isolating DNA since I was new at leaf rust and we isolated DNA. And through Craig's work, we were actually able to show that we could actually get Gus to express in rust spores. And we had some initial data to where we showed the plasmids were actually inserting into the genome. But, uh, and, but we were not able to effectively uh, prove that we had actually tagged one of the genes. Later on, uh, as the genome community started moving on, we'd already in major crop species, uh, the back, uh, back sequencing was the thing to do then if you wanted to get your genome sequenced. And so Les had just uh, put to get started putting together the stem rust genome. And uh, Goose Bacharin had done a uh, leaf rust back library. One of the things that's very uh, unique about rust DNA and rust genomics is it's really difficult to get long DNA out of rust. Don't know whether it's because the uh, it's it's just the way we have to get the DNA. You either have to use spores. We all know you can't uh, uh, grow it in culture. So we have to germinate the spores on a media uh, and isolate the DNA from germinated spore mats. So sometime, something about that process, it's really difficult to get long DNA, but Goose worked really hard and, and got a, a nice library. And so we had, he had actually isolated several backs and uh, sent them to me and we put them through the sequencing facility, uh, doing back shearing and uh, piece them together. And once we got those pieced together and got gene called, we were able to do direct comparisons uh, to stem rust. And so Les had provided us the sequence for two supercontigs, which actually represented the two haplotypes in his particular uh, race of PGT. And as you can see from this data, that uh, the, there's collinear collinearity between the two species. But in between there, the repeat elements are quite a bit different. So uh, the blue line, the dark blue here are the genes that were predicted. This particular back was pulled out by a clone for this gene for RAD18. But the lines that I'm showing here show the syntonous genes on the other genomes. But it also showed uh, the uniqueness of the two genomes within PGT and just really how different they are. So this was uh, a, a a step forward in the leaf rust genome and understanding uh, how the how the genome was put together. But probably the biggest thing that really has affected my career the most was uh, Les had been working with uh, Christina Cuomo at the Broad Institute and they were working and getting pretty close to a finished genome for PGT. And he called me up one day and he said, uh, you know, I believe the time is right and people are talking that it might be the right time to do a leaf rust genome. So he encouraged me to put a grant together. And so with Les and Goose Bacharin and Christina, we put a grant into NSF and USDA and we were able to get the leaf rust genome project funded. This was also a very unique time in the world of, of genome sequencing. This was the time where we were phasing out the old 3730s, which was based on Sanger sequencing, where you get one sample per lane and you could get uh, six to 800 bases of DNA per run and only do 100 samples roughly every two hours. So the accuracy was very good, but it's still very expensive to get the sequence. So at this time, the 454 machines were coming online. They were greatly advancing the amount of DNA that we could get. Uh, also, the Illumina sequencing was also starting. Even though they were very short reads at the time, they could actually crank out a lot of data. So we started down this road. Uh, I 
uh, we decided on sequencing the race one, which was collected in the 1950s. Uh, its uh, type is BBBD. For those of you who don't know, I'll explain a little bit more about that. But what this race represented was it represented a race that was highly avirulent and, at the, and really only has virulence to about three genes, uh, resistance genes. So it, if we were going to go effector hunting, this would be a, a good race to do it. So uh, we got the race, purified it, sent the DNA to the broad, and they were able to sequence it using 454 and started the assembly. But the unique thing that happened was that uh, during this time that the sequencing costs started dropping. And so Christina would continually call me up and say, hey, we still got money. And so Jim Calmer then stepped in and was able to provide us with many races that he had collected, not only just within the US, but Canada, also with Europe and some Ethiopian races. So it was an, a unique way to really look at uh, the different, or it, it gave us a really opportunity to really look to see how these isolates and how these races were evolving. So, <clears throat> so uh, this, this, this paper that I'm showing here also during that time, uh, Ming Chin, who I see is on in the group, uh, his group and Scott Holbert were also sequencing a um, uh, Striiformis isolate that they had. And so we were able to put all of these together uh, with the help of the Broad Institute uh, to really look at the three genomes to see. Uh, it was a really good uh, initial uh, assembly, though they were all haploid assemblies. Uh, of the three big serial rusts. And so it was, I, I believe it was a big step forward in, in us understanding uh, what the genomes were about. But in my title, I, I talk about leaf rust races and the emergence of them. For those of us that work in the field, it's great job security because as, as the rust changes, then uh, that means uh, for the breeders is we got to go find new resistance for them. They have to get it integrated and uh, the cycle is continuing. And as the sign on Bob Bowden's door says, rust never sleeps. And therefore it, it's a constant battle for all of us. So, but, but the understanding about how this happens is we really don't know. We always assumed that it was by mutation uh, the new races would always seem to appear with the release of a new leaf rust resistance gene. And so uh, it, it, you, we just didn't know. And really most of the biology that we know about leaf rust is based on uh, virulence or avirulence to particular leaf rust resistance genes. And we're a very common audience here. And so I won't go into many details but this is how we determine what races are in leaf rust. You do something very similar in the other uh, uh, rust. But basically is we have, uh, and in leaf rust it's unique, is that we have an isogenic uh, Thatcher uh, differential set. And so we have a set of these represents the resistance genes. Uh, and so we set these up in sets of four and based on how that particular isolate that was collected reacts to this group of resistance genes, then the race is given a designation, a, a letter designation that, that helps us identify it. And so uh, the TTKS that you see in stem rust is based on a very similar system. So basically this is really for, for a long time, the major biology that we know about the fungus. So, but how do the, the question still is, is how do we, how does this happen? How do these new isolates come about? Well, one of the first things uh, that, and it was really due to the fact that we just didn't have the sequencing avail uh, capability, uh, many people were doing ESTs and those are cDNA clones made from various tissues. And Lee Huang was a postdoc with, with uh, Bikram Gill and I, and she had isolated Hostoria and made a cDNA library. And then um, Vanessa Segovia was a PhD student. 
she sequenced the library and we identified these clones here that had the characteristics of what an effector protein might look like. It has a secretion signal, it uh, is short, uh, and uh, it has a tag at the um, uh, amino terminus. And so we took these clones and we started to use gene gun uh, as a method of trying to verify this. And in this work, uh, this is based on the idea that as you, you can co-bombard a clone expressing the particular candidate with another clone expressing Gus. The idea is, is that if this protein or this gene produces a protein that triggers hypersensitive response, the cells would die off and you would not see blue. So uh, the particular uh, our gene that we were looking at where it was LR26, which is a rye translocation. And uh, as you can see, these three were the candidates that were mainly working on uh, the PT3. You saw no difference between Thatcher, LR26, and Thatcher. The nice thing, as I said, these are isogenic. Uh, back, uh, uh, these are six back crosses. Uh, so they're very isogenic to Thatcher. So it makes a nice genetic uh, background to do this kind of work in. We have PT12 here, you see no difference, but the in PT27, we see a significant reduction in blue spots. So this was a candidate that we have, but as you all know, is that we really actually need the gene, uh, the resistance gene to actually do the proof. And at this time, this gene was not cloned and there was, uh, we did not have the tobacco system that we have now to actually prove what the resistance uh, that these two actually interact. So then came along the leaf rust genome. So the assembly that we put together is a haploid assembly. Uh, and so uh, the one that's been currently available is we call that version two. Uh, it's a 31x coverage. The haploid assembly is 135 megabases. It's pretty fragmented. Uh, and there's a lot of con contigs in it, and then a contig in 50 is pretty short. But we compared that to Les's genome, which was uh, made uh, using Sanger, and uh, which is 12x, and it's 88 for a haploid genome, the Striformis PST78 uh, genome, which was also being done by Broad at that time, was 117. Megabases and so leaf rust is really the larger of the three. We found that uh, about half the genome of this assembly was repetitive elements. So being a glutton for punishment, not only working on a hexaploid wheat that is full of retro elements, I now work on a dicaryotic uh, organism that is 50% re repetitive. So uh, I, I must, we all must enjoy working with the difficult systems. But in this genome, we predicted about 15,000 genes of which 13, a little over 1,300 were predicted to have secretion signals. So that's a huge effector uh, complement. Uh, as we all know, the different stages that uh, leaf rust has, it needs a lot of these genes for all the different hosts and different stages and the, uh, uh, the different structures that it needs. But the interesting things uh that that we saw is that if we took the Illumina data for race one went back to the genome there were still over 300,000 SNPs so it indicated that uh the genome uh the two genomes in the two nuclei were quite a bit different but as I said earlier we had lots of money and still left over and so with Jim Comer's help we identified 121 different races of Tritocina and sequenced them using Illumina, went back to the genome that we had just produced, looked for SNPs, then did comparisons, and then uh, moved on uh, from there. So these are the various clades that we came about. It backed up the data that Jim had already had. This Beltoides here is from an Agelops uh, that we think is probably one of the progenitors of the races that we know, but the Ethiopian Durhams. And the North American clades were very unique. Race one that we sequenced is down here. Uh, key thing to find out was that uh, there was a lot of SNPs. 
and the Speltoides race, which I just mentioned, was very different. However, that the heterozygosity at each one of these SNPs was very low, whereas in North American uh, uh, one, it was very high. So it showed us that at least within the uh, genome, uh, uh, within itself, that the, there was a lot of heterozygosity at these SNPs. Uh, the genome was very collapsed. And so a lot of what we see right here is based on those two genomes being collapsed. We did a PCA analysis. Uh, and the question was, uh, are these mutations found across the genome? Or as some people were, uh, have pointed out, is that the selection's happening in the secreted proteins or in the, in the secretome. And so we evaluated the SNPs and clustered them based on that regime, whether it's whole genome or predicted secreted proteins. And what you can see is even though that these charts are flipped, that the clustering of the various groups remains about the same. Race one is down here. This is the European group, the North American five, North American three, the Durham. They pretty much all cluster about the same. So that was interesting. So then we looked at the diversity uh, of based on pi and FST of the population substructure and what this showed that when you look at all the genes uh, and versus secreted proteins, basically the SNP diversity has no significant difference. And then if you look across the genome of the SNPs, across the genome versus those that are just within the secreted proteins, we find there's, a, there's some difference, just a slightly more significant in the secreted peptides. But in general, the mutations are, are, are spread out across the genome. We're not seeing one particular place based on the version two haploid genome where we're seeing uh, certain regions that are getting selected over it. So the conclusion that we came out in this paper just came out this uh, summer was that without sexual recombination, recurrent selection across the genome and selection are the major factors in race evolution. And I think it's just happenstance that the that uh, whatever resistance gene happens to be in the field is what is pulling out these particular uh, uh, isolates. So the idea was was okay. Now that we got this data, can we can we uh, find certain SNPs that are associated with particular effector changes? And what we found out that certain region or certain genes they're scattered all out. So you get LR10, LR30, 18, 2A, 26, same thing down here. There just wasn't any consistencies. When we did a GWAS, what we found out was that uh, shifts for LR1, LR17, uh, over 2,000 contags were associated with a shift with LR21. 2,500 contags were associated with a shift in LR17. So we just didn't see anything unique. We saw some down here with LR16, 28, and 3BG, but the number of isolates that we have with changes in these just didn't uh, make any sense. So we've been using fast neutrons to try to do knockouts. We uh, expose the spores to fast neutrons. We have a nuclear reactor here on campus. We look for spores that would that could overcome the particular resistance gene and the and Thatcher ice line. This is LR2C, the spore here. This is LR26. So we've isolated mutants that can overcome the resistance to these particular genes. And uh, we've we've sequenced Illumina sequenced the genomes. If you look here at uh, the differential lines. Changes isolates that are high on LR2A are also on two, high on 2B and 2C. Same thing with 2B and 2C. So I'm pretty sure that the effector that is recognized by these three allelic resistance genes is, is probably the same. Uh, and then we have LR16 and LR11, as I said, uh, uh, also have mutants for these effectors. So we have all the DNA sequenced. However, we still had that haploid genome and uh, just move past that because of time. So what I really needed 
was a fully phased genome where we could separate the, the, the haploids into two separate nuclei because what I was seeing and what other people were seeing was that the assemblies that we had were missing a lot. And I talked to Peter Dodds in, in Glasgow at the meetings there, and he was saying, yeah, we tried to find one effector and it just was missing. And so everybody about the same time with their particular rust race went about to, to put together a better genome. Why? It's a true representative of the two nuclei. Uh, if it uh, facilitates haploid specific transcriptome and annotation. Understanding the evolutionary course of haplotypes in a population. Uh, the look at novel genes and effectors, and we can determine what genes uh, are truly heterozygous or are just uh, absent in one genome and present in the other. So uh, with work with Goose Bacharin and uh, his postdoc Sean Formby and Steve Halem, we've been we've set out uh, to work and putting together version 3.0 of the leaf rust genome. So there have been several pa uh, papers that have just come out, and uh, one is from Jana Sperschneider's. Uh, it's in BioArchive. Uh, they've put together uh, one for uh, Petri de Sina, so does Robert Park's group. Uh, each one's uh, are uh, in Yana's uh, assembly. They, they do have two haplotypes, but the various contigs haven't been assigned to various to the specific nuclei. Uh, Robert Park's work, there's no curation. Uh, there's contigs don't, uh, there's some issues with them. And uh, people are, and they did not use high C to do the scaffolding. So we set out to do a simplified diploid assembly uh, using long reads, uh, which and then using this pipeline of purging, calling variants, haplotagging, putting them into haplotype one and haplotype two, then going back and uh, refiltering and reassembling. Uh, we believe that we've got a pipeline pretty much worked out uh, where we can do this. We're using the Oxford Nanopore system, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, Dave said that uh, Diane has put together a system for field base where we can use this harmonica shaped uh, sequencer that's cheap to uh, do the genomes. Uh, I had already been putting together uh, Nanopore, David Cook who's in my department, introduced me to the system. So very quickly, I was able to produce a 76X coverage with read links of over 22 KB. And if you think about uh, the Sanger sequencing, the 600 base pairs, this is very significant, especially when working in a repetitive uh, uh, genome. We already had Illumina data from the previous uh, work, and I'd already done some high C work. The key thing about this is that I was using the same spore mats and the same isolates and the same spore collections that was done on version 2.0. Just quickly go through here. This is the initial assembly. We looked at uh, four different uh, assemblers. Kanu is really the current one that everybody seems to be using in the fungal world. Uh, it is diploid aware, but uh, uh, it showed some issues, uh, a larger genome that we were really expecting. We settled on NECAT, which uh, went from 14, almost 15,000 contigs to 120. The longest one was 8.4. So it looked like uh, a very good genome or assembler. So through our pipeline, we were able to uh, separate them out into two haplotypes, very small, uh, very small number of contigs. The most unique thing is that we are consistently getting the longest contig to be about 9.4 megabase pairs. So we think the longest chromosome is this length. Uh, through polishing and, uh, and using the reads and working on making sure we can get them separated into the haplo haplotypes, we're now down to the point where 50% of the contigs are above, above 7.1 megabases. Uh, at uh, 90% of them now, we have 21 contigs, super contigs, and, and 17 for H2. And 
each genome now we believe is 126 to 125 megabase pairs. So we're pretty confident that the total genome now is about 250, about the twice the size. So are there any major differences between the haplotypes? Yes. This is the H1 genome. These are the reads for phase that were phased to H1. These were the long reads phased to H2. This is a predicted effector. This is another gene here that has been split, but you can definitely see that there's a gap here. So uh, my weight, I hope, in, in trying to find these effectors has not been in vain because we're definitely showing that in one haplotype, there are genes present that might that are predicted to be effectors that are missing in the other. So we really feel like that uh, the genome that we're putting together and we're putting the finishing touches on it right now and hope to have the uh, paper out soon. So like I say, this is work uh, mostly done by Sean Formby, who is, uh, and this is the data that he has put together, uh, the data that I've shown using my sequence uh, and some of Goose's sequence. Uh, and then uh, Halem is doing the gene prediction. So these are the collaborators that I've had during this time. Carla is my new technician who's doing the sequencing and uh, Joe is my new student working on some other uh, leaf rust aspects, but on the plant side, Craig Webb did uh, like this, uh, did the uh, uh, transformation work. Myron Bruce had, did some of the uh, assembly work on the backs and Vanessa Segovia, like I said, did the cDNA work. But also Jim Comer has been also another mentor and a friend at the CDL and uh, has really taught me a lot and been patient with me. Both he and Les has been patient with me in my transition from wheat genomics over to the fungus side. Uh, Goose has become a long term friend and collaborator and, and we've worked uh, well together in producing these leaf rust genomes. Uh, Sean works for him, but as uh, he works tirelessly to make sure that the assemblies that he puts together are accurate, and uh, I really appreciate his tenacity. Uh, David Cook introduced me and to the new platform. Fahey was a postdoc that uh, was working with me and Edward Akhanov. Harold is uh, my transformation buddy, and Katie is my, our new bioinformaticist in our unit, and she's helping me on the new aspects on looking to try to find SNPs and deletions now that we have this new genome put together. So uh, as I has been said before, it's been an honor and a privilege to work with Les and, and everyone there at the CDL. I think I met Les uh, uh, early, in, early in my career and it really has, uh, has uh, helped me a lot. So at this time, I'll take questions. Thank you very much, John, for that excellent presentation. John, are you able to, to share your video now, by chance? Which video? Just your um, your video of, of yourself. Does that work now? Oh, let me try that. There we go. Okay. Nice to see you, John. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't have the video earlier for you, no Morgans or Dave. Um, we're out of time for, for questions uh, for John, but you guys are welcome to um, write a question in the chat or the Q&A, and I'm sure John will be able to, to get back with you uh, directly um, in that manner. And at this time, I'll 